Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, our Behaviour Blueprint. So my name's Avril Townsend and I've been teaching for nearly 20 years now. And I would like to introduce Tanya Alex Price, who's our guest speaker today. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Tanya. I've been teaching since two, uh, 2003. I've been teaching history. Um, I've been an NQT mentor and also a subject mentor. And I recently launched my own academy called the Price Academy, which is bite-sized history videos on YouTube and my own Facebook page. I've also launched a history group on Facebook called History Teachers UK Share Space which has been going for three weeks and we have got 1.2k members in that time and that is how I met Gary and Avril through my Facebook group. Thank you Tanya. So my name is Gary Talbot. Uh, welcome to this uh, Behaviour Blueprint webinar. Um, I've been a teacher for over 10 years now. Um, I've been a, an assistant head of science, a lead practitioner of science and also an assistant head teacher as well. Um, and what we did was when we were planning this, um, this webinar, and we realized when we actually got all the stuff together, that the behavior section was absolutely massive. Um, and it's such an important topic uh, that we didn't want to sort of do it, you know, a disservice or anything. So what we decided to do was create it in two parts. So the first part, which we're going to do live with you guys today is behavior blueprint 1.0. Um, and in this webinar, we're going to discuss um, two topics mainly. So how to prevent disruption happening in your class in the first place and then how you can get your class to actually be quiet and different techniques that you can use and i'll explain at the end of the webinar and um, how you can watch this the second part of it because uh, obviously we didn't want you guys sitting here for two hours and um, you know you probably fall asleep by then um, or, or you you've got lots of things to do and um, so we sort of split it up and i'll explain a little bit more at the end well done if you managed to get the answers for the blanks so the first one they're actually real situations that have happened um, so the first one uh, was that a bird came into Avril's classroom once uh, and she ran out screaming. I think I would as well. I think someone put a pigeon in there. Quite a lot of people put bird. Second one, um, I was overwhelmed once where there was a, a really nice science poem someone had written for me. It didn't have a name on it. And I've still to this day never found out who actually wrote that poem. But it was absolutely lovely. Um, and I've still got it on paper. And then obviously, finally, uh, Tanya's answer was a mobile phone while she was doing a a live lesson so thank you very much so over to you Avril you're going to start yeah so um throughout the webinar today um you can use the Q&A function if you want to ask us any specific questions and we've got time at the end uh, where we can uh, look at some of those questions and also if you could use the chat function so throughout the different slides that you'll see on the screen today um there's some black bold text so if there's any questions in black bold text if you want to contribute by sharing your ideas you can do that in the chats and we'll contribute we'll get those together at the end and, and produce a document that we can share with everybody, everybody that's participated today we always like to start our webinars with a quote as a good teacher would um, and i found this quote um, i think it's a cyber security guy or something don brown but i thought it was quite pertinent in terms of behavior um, that you know as, as teachers sometimes we, we just see the behavior of, of the child um, and without realizing or thinking or trying to dig deeper as to there must be a problem going on for, for that person to behave in that way and um, so i thought it was quite a nice quote to start off with so i'm going to talk to you about the different prevention strategies to prevent uh, inappropriate behaviours in classrooms. So prevention obviously is, is if we can prevent the behaviours from happening that's going to make our lives a lot easier rather than dealing with the aftermath afterwards. Um, so that's it's relevant at the moment with, with the coronavirus if we can prevent the spread it's going to make all our lives a lot easier in, in terms of dealing with that. So the first um, strategy that I'd like to talk to you about is a seating plan. Um, I always use a seating plan with all of my classes. Sometimes I'll, I'll pre-prepare it by having it up on, on the screen and asking the students to find the places on entry. Um, sometimes I'll do it if they're lining up outside and then I can see the friendship groups if it's a, a completely new class that I'm not familiar with or I don't know them. If they're lining up in huddles, then I would tactically separate those huddles because they're probably lining up in the friendship groups. And also in a larger classroom, I've had issues where 
larger tall students or the smaller students if you place them right at the back and you've got some taller ones at the front it just causes problems with being able to see the board so sometimes I'll, I'll arrange them in um, the height order you can also do it in boy girl that quite often works well you can pair them up in ability so you can have uh, students supporting each other you might want to do it based on behavior record or uh, any SEND needs that the students might have so uh, the, on the bottom right hand of the screen there, and um, that's a snippet from class charts. So my previous school had this and um, it's a great um, tool to use. So you can arrange the students and base it around your classroom. You can draw out the table layout, everything prior to your lesson. You can review the, the, the seating plans regularly. So you don't have to stick with the, the first one that you've done. So quite often I will do a new seating plan after a week if, if things aren't settling in the lesson. You can use it as a sanction as well. So if, if students like where they're sitting, you can also suggest that if, you carry, if they're causing problems, you might move them to a different position in the classroom. I always have the desk, uh, the desk set out as well with the books ready for the students to collect on the way in or they can have it in their actual place so that once they enter, they can get straight on task as well. Avoids any of the books being given out. And a feature that Class Charts is offering at the moment, which is a brand new update, is a COVID track and trace. So if there was an outbreak with one student, you can actually track and trace who they've been sat with in other lessons which is obviously a really, really fantastic tool that, that it offers at the moment. So secondly, relationships. I think this is one of the most important features of, of getting behaviour right in your classroom. So having strong teacher-students relationships and also teacher-parent relationships, it's absolutely crucial to, to having good behaviour in your lessons. It can be an idea if you've got a new class at uh, start of a new year to have some sort of icebreaker activity where they come in. You might want them to start building a tower and have like a group task where they can work collectively and you can circulate and get to know the students and see how they work together in groups. It's really important to show that you care and that you've got passion for your subject during your first few lessons so that they see that you're really interested in, in what the students want. If you can find out, use the information that you collect from these activities, then you can collect the information using one of the, the templates that we're going to provide with you. So there's a little image of that on the screen there. That's quite nice to find out the likes, the dislikes, their experiences of school as well. And then you can use that to build relationships. So if you see them on the corridors, if you see them outside of school, it just gives you something else to talk to the students about that might not be subject based. You could also use this, uh, these sort of questions on a Google form and then you can download it and read through it at your own pace. I quite often have this sort of template glued into the front of exercise books and when I'm marking books I'll have a, a quick look at what they've done and a reminder of, of what the student likes and dislikes. So we've got um, an example of an icebreaker that a teacher's used on this clip. Just checking you can see our rule, yeah? Yep, it's, it's on, just do a big screen. It's a major piece for kids to have a safe and predictable environment. If we create that culture where they know that we love them and we know that we believe in them, that's like vital to the closing the achievement gap. The first thing that I do every year is we start by kind of creating that family atmosphere within our within my classroom. Um, and by doing that, we do family greetings. So the kids actually interview each other, asking like, what's your favorite color? What is your favorite game to play? How many siblings do you have with really simple questions? Um, so they kind of can create that common ground between the two of them. And then they always um, have to kind of point out the commonalities, like what did we have in common? What things were the same between the two of us? Um, so they get to interview everyone in the classroom throughout um, the first month of school. And I think that kind of just starts by creating that sense of family, that classroom culture that we're really looking for. I want the kids to know that it's a fresh new start. So every morning I greet them with a handshake um, in the doorway, with a handshake, 
eye contact, a smile, um, and we practice that a lot at the beginning of the school year, and they know to respond to me with a handshake, eye contact, and a smile, and a greeting as well. Um, and it's kind of letting them know that whatever happened earlier in the morning, um, you can forget, and this is a fresh start. You're safe in this classroom. Um, we're a family in here. We're going to take care of each other, and it's kind of that fresh start for the day. It's great to have within classrooms. Um, the classroom culture piece and having that family, but it's even more effective if you have it as a whole school. Um, so really implementing it in every classroom, making sure every classroom is feeling safe, making sure as a whole school, um, you know, you're able to go up to students and talk with them and interact with them and they feel that safe environment wherever they are in the school, not just within your own classroom. My first teaching job um, in an urban setting, I could feel the, the love that they had for me when I was giving the, you know, the consistent expectations and providing that safe environment. Um, and I, I just saw them flourish so much. In the beginning of the year, there is, you know, a lot, maybe kids are acting out or struggling or kind of trying to figure out where they belong. But because we create that classroom culture and they know that we're all a family, you kind of see um, day to day that behavior dwindle away. We've seen it in our test scores, our growth. Um, every classroom in our school has that classroom culture piece where we've really made it a family um, atmosphere, a safe, predictable family atmosphere. I think because they know it is safe and predictable, all of their focus is on their academics. So I think relationships is something that you need to build on. Even if you don't get it right at the beginning, don't be afraid to, to start afresh with that and, and constantly try to, to get those relationships working with the students. Um, I found this on um, Twitter. So we've provided you with the link of this. So it's just a nice little display that you might want to have on your desk uh, for you to read through. So next I'm going to talk to you about establishing clear routines and setting high expectations. So from day one it's really important to set the tone of how you want your classroom to be and feel. Make it really clear to the students how you expect them to conduct themselves in the lesson with little simple things like how to enter the class, how, to, how do they communicate so if they want something, if they need something, how do they actually do that and, and establishing manners at the start as well and making sure that they're, they're going to be well polite throughout the lesson. Ask them to share with you uh, what they expect from you as a teacher but also what do they expect from each other in the classroom. This is a really good way of, of doing it collaboratively and then if you get them to work together and establishing some rules you're a lot more likely to get the students to, to buy in and cooper cooperate with those rules that you've established as a, as a group. So some of the uh, standards that you might expect in a lesson is to have uh, good behaviour and prevent off-task behaviour. So by doing that, there's lots of different tiny little routines that you might want to practice and think of before you start your lessons in September. So the way they enter and exit, how to ask for help, like I've said before, what do they do if they need the toilet? What do they need to do if they arrive late to lesson? What if they finished work? If, is there any issues that might be affecting completion of homework and how to collect in equipment? So being a science teacher, setting up practicals and things like that, it, it has to be planned out and it can really help with lessons running a lot more smoothly. And one that's also you might not think about um, is giving out handouts. So it might take two to five minutes to distribute some handouts. So it might be a good idea to practice some of these routines so that you, you get all these routines running smoothly in your lesson. So good ways of doing that is to practice them and then reinforce the students with positive feedback and praise to comment on how they're actually carrying out those little routines. And if it's not working out, you know, we've all had lessons where we might have to ask a, a class to enter on, on two or more occasions. So don't be afraid of doing that. And even if it's not in the first week, you might have to get them to practice routines in the middle of the year because they might have slackened off a little bit. So the video I'm going to show you now, uh, if you've ever seen uh, Teach Like a Champion, uh, which is Doug Lemonov, and um, what he did is he went around the country in America and he filmed <clears throat> lots of teachers 
um, effective teachers doing different things. Um, and this is an example of a teacher who actually practices at the beginning of the year, uh, students handing out worksheets. Uh, and he, he does it to try and make it quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, and some of the other teachers, when, you know, when they look at the video, they kind of laugh at it and think, you know, what's this guy doing? You should be teaching them, you know, science or maths or whatever. Uh, and he's teaching them how to hand out worksheets. But then when, when they actually thought about it, um, they realised that he can, he can hand out, you know, a set of, of worksheets to a whole class in 10 seconds. Whereas other teachers, I know I've been guilty myself, you know, sometimes it might take a minute or two minutes. And if you add all that up throughout the year, that's a lot of time wasted just handing out worksheets. So I'm going to show you a quick video uh, from that teacher just showing how he does it with his class. But one thing I do want to work on is how to pass out papers, okay? I'm going to pass papers on the row, and they're going to come over. The only person who needs to get out of their seat is my friend James, because James is a big space between James and Bruce. So let me show you what I will do. I will hand out, there's four people here. So I'm going to put four pieces of paper here. Denzel will take one, and he'll put, hand the other stack to James. James will put one down, and James will quietly go to Bruce. Bruce will take one, and he'll quietly give it to his friend, Mr. Sanford. It's an excellent job. It's exactly what happened. 12 seconds, back in in 10. Eleven seconds, back out in ten. Back in in eight. It's pretty good. All right. So one thing we're also going to do in this class, we have. I think it's quite evident there that at the start of the year, you know, we always worry that we have to get on with teaching the curriculum. Um, but I think it's really important to get those routines established uh, straight away in your lesson because um, it will save you a lot of time and, and kids will get used to that routine of how you do certain things. I know as a science teacher, when I first started, you know, getting kids to tidy up after a practical, uh, you know, was, was sometimes just like chaos. And um, so it's practicing those skills and, and how you expect it to be done. And if they don't do it right, you know, you, you put it all back and you say, right, we're going to try again. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you, that might overrun into the break or lunch or whatever. Um, but at least you know that those routines are, are embedded. So there is a, a bit of a reading list as well uh, from the Education Endowment Foundation at the end, looking, which goes into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the link will be on a slide at, at the end. So I'm going to talk to you about establishing a, a positive learning behaviour. So learning behaviour is all about the students being able to, to learn in lessons in an effective way. So in my lessons, I've been guilty of, of disciplining students and they might have stopped disrupting in my lesson, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they've started to engage in the lesson. They might have just simply stop talking or they might have sat down and stopped turning around. But it's really important. We need to establish really strong learning behaviours from our students in lessons so that they actually can go on to learn. If we establish really strong learning behaviours, it's going to benefit the students. It's going to increase the cognitive ability and overall their academic achievements. So there's three aspects of this. So the first one is trying to increase in the engagement of the students. So that's about getting the students to be more motivated to complete the work and giving them challenging and supporting work that they're able to complete. Improving the access is number two, and that's ensuring that the tasks are differentiated to, to suit the needs of the students. Number three is ensuring participation. So it's really good to establish a culture where the students are proud to share a task that will um, and be not afraid to say oh that was really challenging that but they've actually persevered with it and, and not not been afraid to get things wrong and if we can get these three things correct in lesson it's it's going to improve the outcomes for all
It was quite interesting. There was a study done in 2018 uh, looking at why students misbehave. And they, they, did, they asked lots and lots of classes and, and teachers um, across, I think it was America. Um, and they actually found that 20% um, was, was due to that second one. There. So it's quite a high proportion of pupils that were, were behaving in a poor way because either they didn't understand the task or they couldn't do the task. So it was either the teacher instruction or it was at the difficulty of the task itself. So I think that's really important to, to make sure that the work we're doing is differentiated, pitched at the right, the right level, um, and we've, we've explained it clearly in, in a few different times as well. So quite often when you get a new class or students in, you, in your classroom, you might assume that they, they know all the skills to be able to participate in the lessons. So one of the most important social skills that quite often has to be taught is, is listening skills. So students at the home environment that might not be used to listening to instructions or not having the need to listen to instructions as clearly at home and, and how to communicate as well. So one strategy that you can use is actually to teach some of those skills that some of the students might be struggling with in your lessons and then uh, so they're able to comply with them. So, for example, if it was a listening skill that you wanted to improve with a class or individual students, you might want to give them a little prompt card to actually point out exactly what it is that they need to be doing when they're listening. So it might be that they have the eyes on you, their, their arms folded, whatever sort of routines you want to establish when you expect the students to, to be listening. You don't have to have it on a prompt card, but that might be useful for some students to have. You can then model the skill to show them how they actually need to carry that out and then give them time to practice. So you might want to dedicate a lesson or parts of the lesson where they can practice that skill. And again, it's about giving reinforcement and feedback on how they've, they've actually conducted themselves with that particular skill. The pupils, as they get used to that, they, they could then go on and self-assess using that uh, little prompt card or a monitoring card. So there's loads of different do's and don'ts that you can do in, in your lessons to sort of avoid and prevent disruptive behaviours, but I've just narrowed it down to, to five of the top ones. There is going to be a link that you'll get a resource that's got many more strategies on there, um, but I just wanted to go through some of the, the top five that I picked out as, as my favourites. So number one, don't mimic or use uh, sarcasm or derogatory language towards the students. Nobody likes to be spoken to in that way and the children can get embarrassed and it can just cause conflict in lessons. Not to compare them with other students or if they've got siblings. Um, I've taught students where we've, we've, there's been, you know, one member of the family who might have been really disruptive in lessons, but don't tie them with the same brush. Everybody should be entitled to have like a fresh start and not be compared with others. Not to have double standards of treating everybody fairly and, and the same. In, in your lessons and within other classes as well. Don't ever reward unacceptable behaviour and not to bear grudges. Fresh start every lesson and if they know that you're not still going on about an incident that happened last week or in the previous lesson, they know that they're off to a fresh start. So the do's, uh, don't talk over, um, over students. So if you're talking, you make sure that the full class is, is quiet and they're listening. Use visual cues in your own presence. So if somebody is causing a little bit of disruption, a bit of eye contact or a little uh, position yourself, go and walk over to that side of the classroom. Uh, something that I do quite often is if there's an eye contact or conversation going on between two students, I'll just stand and position myself in between them so they can't actually see each other. Give the students choices uh, choices as to what, what they should do. So if you're giving them, if they're talking, give them an opportunity to try something else or, you know, you should be doing this and just give them an opportunity to decide what they need to do rather than uh, being disruptive. Teach alternative behaviours. So give them opportunities to suggest different ways of, if they're in a group and they're, they're chatting to the friends and they're off task, give them right set. What you should you be doing now? You've got a choice. You either need to be completing this work or you can be sharing your ideas down on paper, but you've not to be talking uh, about conversations that aren't related to the subject. 
and point out the positives as much as you can in lessons. So you need to try and aim to have at least five positives to every one negative in your lessons. And that's sometimes hard to remember. So it might be useful to have that up on a display in your room, might have a five to one ratio or something like that to remind you to, to point out the phrase. And the rewards and rewards and rewards is absolutely massive. It's gonna make a massive difference to relationships and behavior and ultimately the outcomes. So we're going to look at the different types of rewards and uh, in types of motivation the students can have. So it, it, when students have intrinsic motivation, they actually want to learn and they want to do well in your lessons. So there's different types of rewards that you can give that are either going to improve that or not. So one that decreases in intrinsic motivation is if you say to the students, for example, I'm going to give you a gold sticker if you start your work. That's not going to get the students to want to do start the work. They're just doing it to get that reward, which isn't really beneficial. Another example is where you say, right, if you do all your work, I'm going to give you a chocolate. So they might do it, but it's not going to increase the intrinsic motivation. We want to try to aspire to have our students wanting to learn on their own accord, not because they're going to get a reward at the end of it. So those two types of strategies, they would they don't increase the intrinsic motivation. And that this doesn't have any effect on intrinsic motivation either. So if you give unexpected rewards, so for example, you give the whole class an achievement point for working on an activity, that's again, that's not going to increase their intrinsic motivation to want to do really well in a lesson. Another example is when they, the rewards are not dependable on task performance. So the teacher might bring in sweets for the class saying, oh, I thought, thought you'd treat us all today. So that's, again, it's not going to increase their intrinsic motivation, but what it might do, it might actually help to build the relationships between yourself and the students. So it might actually have a positive effect, but we want to try and do as much rewards that are linked to actually increase, increase, increasing that intrinsic motivation so the students actually want to do the work for their own benefit so that they can learn. So an example of what you can do to, to do that is like positive narration. So, oh, I've really liked how you've used lots of keywords in, in your explanation. And this is um, something that you might need to start writing down some little statements that uh, what you can say throughout your lessons because it is it is easy to forget you can say things like well done and you're good at that but that's not proven to 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 give that increase in intrinsic motivation it's a lot better if you say things like well i really love how you've shown how you've worked that calculation out in mathematics or i really love how you've set up that practical in science or i really like how you've just done that skill in sport so it's being very specific and, and positively narrating throughout your lessons so that the pupils feel good. And then when they come to your lessons, they more likely want to, to do well in that lesson for their own intrinsic motivation to increase because they enjoy it. So it's, it's important that we try to give the right sort of feedback and praise to the students. So as an example of a little YouTube clip to show you, these are, it's actually some parents at home that use this to help improve the, the behaviour of the children. Hey Nick, Sophie, time for dinner. Come to the table please. Thanks for coming when I called guys. That was softball, sir. You did really well, Nick. I really liked how you shook hands with the other team, even though you'd lost. Yeah, well. I'm getting a drink. Do you want one, Hill? Yeah. Dad? No, I'm good, but thanks. Good time at the party last night. Hey, thanks for calling when you were running late. I appreciated that. Hey Jess. Thanks for your help with your sister today. You've been a big help with her all week and your mum and I really appreciate it. No worries.
just using strategies like that, although you might expect the student to come in, sit down and, and do everything all nice all the time, but that's the type of praise and reward that's actually going to have the, the most benefit. So if we can use that as much as possible in the lessons, or thank you for coming in and sitting down and getting on with your work straight away, all those little statements that you can just say in the lesson, and it makes the students feel good, but it's also going to build up over time to get the students love coming to your lessons and actually wanting to do well in your lesson. And finally, from me, it's consistency is a word that's always mentioned in a school environment. Um, surprisingly, only a quarter of secondary and half of primary school teachers agreed that behaviour policy in their school was applied consistently. So obviously within each of the teachers' classrooms, you've got your own standards, but there's always going to be a whole school policy. And it's really important that you as an individual teacher, you apply that whole school policy to your lessons and school leaders they will they will select different types of behavior policies that research suggests works best with with those sort of students so that's why all the students at schools are going to have different approaches to, to behavior but one thing i would um, advise is in all schools there's always going to be disruptive students and there's always going to be a wide variety of teachers in in that school environment and every time you're going to have teachers who can manage and deal with disruptive students in their lessons so it's as, especially as a new teacher but even an experienced one the best way of of learning how to be a teacher and develop as a teacher is to go in as many lessons and see as many teachers doing their job in the classroom and you can pick up little tips and that uh, from each other from other teachers in your school so if you're having issues with a particular student then maybe speak to a teacher that knows that student well and ask them how they deal with it or go, on, go into their lessons to see how they deal with it in, in the lesson. Hello, it's over to me. Um, so I'm going to be looking at how you can get a class to be quiet because obviously to be able to do your job as a teacher, you need them to be listening. So we're going to start off by watching a clip and while you're watching the clip or after you've watched it I want you to write in the chat down an idea that you liked from this video and would like to try in September or whenever you go back to school to get a class to be quiet. Hi guys so we're here in Cyprus today <laughs> it's 10 to 4 in the afternoon so everyone is really really tired we've just gone through phonics they've done really well they've done well on everything else on the all the business stuff and everything they're really tired but we're going to get to show you guys some of the discipline techniques how it works in real action so the first one the very simplest one is just doing the standing up and sitting down make sure they all do it nice and quickly even though it's four o'clock in the afternoon with no air cons. everybody stand up stand up make sure you get big voices sit down sit down three two one sit down sit down making mistakes is fine okay uh, <laughs> the next one is this one where you're going to be talking to your partner so i'm just going to get them to do a random thing talking about last night's television or something talk to your partner about what you did yesterday go I want to okay, this is just to get them noisy, and then what I'm going to do is going to bring them back. Yes. yes! Silence, very good, isn't it? So I use the class yes word, and you teach it like this you just go, class? Yes! Class? Yes! Yes, yes, yes! Very good. Uh, that's from the power teaching, so look at power teaching on YouTube, you can check that out. Now, sometimes when they've been too noisy, uh, I want to bring them back, and I can use the clap for that. So talk to the person next to you about what you want for Christmas. So that was making them noisy again. Of course, your kids will be playing a game or doing whatever. And if you clap now, it's really bad. Now, this my boy, you can say. Get them quiet. They've not been that quiet all day. It's fantastic. <laughs> Very good. And uh, one more thing now is if they see my hand in the air, well, they're far too slow. If they see my hand in the air, they have to put their hand in the air and be quiet, okay? So you need to train them to do it really fast. Zero tolerance, everyone has to do it. Down there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Talk to the person next to you about what you liked about this weekend. So I was going to make them noisy again, so hopefully. You've got them trained well, and they're a little bit tired now, but you work with your kids to get them to do it straight away. <laughs> wow, okay, that was pretty cool. You get a tap on the shoulder if somebody's not doing it. So if she's got her arm down, 
We see her with her arm down, we just tap her on the shoulder and she puts her arm up. That's very good. Okay, uh, one more technique is going to be a countdown. Whenever they hear me do a countdown in an activity, they know they have to join in. So I go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Class? Yes. Okay, so let's get the noisy again. Talk to the person next to you about what you would do if you had the best school in Cyprus. Talk to them. Okay, so make so okay, obviously you either pair work to get right to the pair work or to uh, you know, a game or something like that. It's got the top countdown, that's it. Ten, Okay, round of applause, thank you! Okay, so I saw quite a lot of um, interaction there in the chat that you liked some of the ideas uh, from that clip. So I'm going to talk you through seven different ideas that you could use in your classroom to get your class to be quiet. Some of these I have used myself, some of them Gary and Avril have used, and I'm sure some of them you will have used, and some of them were in that clip. So my first one is going to be call and respond. Um, so if you're a primary school teacher or a secondary school teacher, because Gary says he uses best, you could try the call and respond, which is what uh, the guy in the clip was starting off with. So this is like a catchy saying that is a cue for the class to be quiet. So you could say holy to your students and they respond with macaroni, or I quite like one, two, three eyes on me, and they respond with one, two eyes on you, or hey macarina. So if you have used any call and responses before in your own lessons and um, put some examples in the chat and uh, you can find quite a lot of these on uh, the internet so I've got some examples on the other side and um, Gary did you say you had used um, some of these before? Yeah so the, the technique is called power teaching uh, if you want to look it up on YouTube um, and there's a lot of different methods that you can use to get your, your student to, uh, students to respond back to you and so I'll look that up if you uh, you fancy a look. So I think I'm going to try one, two, three eyes on me um, this year because I think that might be a good one. But obviously, if you don't feel comfortable with that. If we have a look at another idea for call and respond. Um, so I've read in the chat a couple of you said you have used the clapping method. So again, I've seen this in action at primary schools and my own son's school used this. So other similar methods I have seen being used while I was um, a learning volunteer at a National Trust property called the Dunham Massey. When primary school teachers were trying to discipline their children or get them to listen, they would clap out the first part of the rhythm and the students would respond back. Obviously in the clip, um, he started clapping and the students also started clapping and Gary, I think you said you've used this one too. Yeah, so I, I've, I've just done it with, like the guy in the video, continuous clapping until everyone's clapping and then you stop them. So that's another idea for call and respond that you could use. The one that I use the most is countdown. So I want you to have a little think and answer the question in the chat as well. And I've seen some of you answer this. Have you ever fallen into the trap of saying shh? and be quiet and stop talking obviously a bit louder than what I'm saying there lesson after lesson all day long so if you have and you, you say yeah I have done this I recognize I've said shh and be quiet and stop talking and um, you can be brave and you know own up to it and um, I will be honest I have done that a few times in my career but it doesn't work does it just saying it just doesn't work so the method i use most consistently to achieve a quiet class or just to get them ready is a countdown so if you have used a countdown or you use that now and i know some of you have said you have just put that in the chat that, yeah i have used it and i'm going to go through um the different ways that you can use a countdown um in the next couple of slides so if you haven't used countdown before, I suppose the thing is, if you're a new teacher, you might need to practice projecting your voice and practice counting down um, or counting up. So it's pretty straightforward. You just simply decide what time you're going to go for. It's generally about five seconds. So you would say in five seconds, I want everyone to listen. And you either start counting up one two you know three four five or you count down it's totally up to you but if you haven't done this before it's maybe a good idea to practice a few times you know getting louder 
if you teach at a primary school, you could use the five finger technique, which was mentioned on the cornerstoneforteachers.com. And um, so this is fairly straightforward. You hold your hand in the air. The children who see your hand start counting to five. When everyone has finished, they stop. They face their teacher with their mouths closed and their ears open. So if you have used the five finger technique, and you're a primary school teacher, just pop in the chat whether you have used that one. Again, that's pretty pretty simple. If you do a bit of training in your introductory lesson, that this is what you expect. Or you could try Harry Wong's Give Me Five. Now, um, there is a poster. There's lots of different posters that you can get off the internet with this already made, so you don't have to go away and make this up. And um, so you have got. Um, the five instructions on that side, but you could make up your own five instructions. So you could decide, say, num you know, if you're counting down from five, one, put your pens down, two, close your books, three, fold your arms, four, look this way. You could make your own five um, instructions, but there is an example. So again, if you've used Harry Wong or you, what Harry Wong's Give Me Five, type in the chat if you've used it and whether you think that's a good technique. So for more challenging classes, which if you teach in secondary, you obviously have a lot of different ones. If you teach in primary, it's the same one. Then you are going to need to maybe use an actual timer on the board. So there's quite a lot of different timer tools. If you're a fan of Kagan, there's a Kagan timer tool. Uh, but you should be able to get a simple timer tool from the internet. So you could use the countdown clock, which is 30 seconds. You could use a Mission Impossible timer, which is three minutes, or you can put whatever time you want on the clock to say, instead of I'm carrying from five or 10, if you need a bit longer, you can physically put that on the board. So if you do use a timer like the countdown or Mission Impossible, or if you have a different one that you like, so Gary mentioned Tidy at Rumba, and I had a listen to that this morning, and that was, that was quite a fun one if you want the class to be tidy at the end you can obviously have a look at those three that I found for you there so if you do use a time and tell the other participants which type you use and whether there's any good ones that you would recommend so the top three tip or well, top tip number three is hand signals now I'm a teacher that uses my hands a lot so my second most used weapon in the classroom to get pupils to be quiet is actually my hands now this can link with your countdown because you can use this as a visual aid obviously when you're counting down you can have five things up and four or whatever you so wish or you can simply use some hand gestures and sign language to get an individual to be quiet. Now I've not used the wiki how one that's on the board there to have the hand signal to be quiet, but you might have. So if you have any hand signals that you use with your class to get them to be quiet rather than counting down, now you could tell the other participants what your hand signals are. And I'll go through some that I use now. So instead of saying shh all the time, a very simple hand signal that doesn't require your lesson to be interrupted is obviously just placing your finger on your lip. Um, I am a bit of a lover of the click and point, so I kind of mastered a click, a very loud click. And um, so if I'm teaching and I can see a pupil is talking, um, I generally click and point at them. Some people find this to be a rude gesture, so it's highly up to you whether you use it or not. But it's something that I have picked up over my career as a way of, instead of stopping me teaching, I can click and point at the pupil, um, as well as obviously putting my finger on my lip and click and point at the same time. Another um, hand signal or lip signal could be just that you show the a zip your lip gesture um, to the pupils that you want to be quiet. And obviously a hand signal for stop is a pretty universal and easy to do one as well. And as we saw in the video, um, as you picked up there, you could easily just raise your hand in the air for quiet. So if you train your class from the beginning, um, when you first meet them, if you say, if I put my hand up in the air, I want all of you to put your hands up in the air. And um, that could be a way, a technique to get them to be quiet, which I have seen uh, used on year six induction days time and time again, when you've got about 200 people in the hall, the main speaker puts their hand up and everyone else follows suit. So that's a good one if you've got a lot of kids um, all together. So my fourth tip is whispering, and Gary says he's used this one as well. 
If you want a class to be quiet, you could also get quieter yourself, okay? So my advice would be not to compete with a noisy class. So sometimes you think, oh, I, I just need to get louder. I need to shout over them or speak louder. I wouldn't advise doing that because you're going to get a sore throat and you, you basically don't want that type of environment. So you could try being quieter and being softer or even whispering and um, so the students um constrained to hear you gary do you want to add anything on to this because you've used this one yeah, i just think it's you know when you start whispering you just sometimes you can just talk random stuff and um, you know they're, they're dead interesting they want to you know hear what you're actually saying so they'd be quiet just so they can and hear you whispering really it's quite a good technique sometimes so if you've used the whisper technique and i've just seen one person has um i haven't used it. i'm not i don't think i'm a very good whisperer and um, I'm, I'm not that good at lowering my tone but it's something i need to work on myself if you have used the whisper technique and you think it works and pop that in the chat but you could you could try that now early on in my career this is probably something that i did do quite often so sometimes i've just completely stopped teaching and instead of whispering i've said nothing at all so i stand at the front of my room and i look totally bored and i might check the, my nails or stare at the ceiling or i might just sit down at my laptop or pc and then I get the timer up so I'm, I'm a fan of the timer and then until everyone is quiet then I'll get back up again um, and carry on so has anyone else used that before and if you have you can put that in the, in the chat so my fifth tip which links up to what Avril was saying is about positive reinforcement so I've used this one a lot as I've got on in my career, which is basically focusing on the positive students and those ones that are actually doing as you request, rather than highlighting the students that aren't. So it's always a good idea to actually thank the students who are being quiet in a descriptive way, as we saw from the clip on descriptive praise. So it could be a phrase like well done for getting ready to learn and being prepared to listen to instructions and i found it's pretty amazing as soon as you start focusing on the positive other students always like well what about me am i not doing what you've asked um and you can do that in columns or rows or however you've got your seating plans um and i find that positive reinforcement makes others fall into line a lot more quickly rather than them just selecting the ones that aren't doing what you want so if you have tried all of the previous tips and they haven't worked, you could try the whole class um, standing up game, which I have used quite a fair few times early on in my career. And obviously every now and then, if I've got a quite a challenging group, I might try this with everything else I've tried it doesn't work. Um, so this is where you get every person in the room to stand up and then you set the timer for a length of time that you see fit, usually about two or three minutes. And then when I see a student as being quiet, I will say their name and say, you can sit down. And when everyone is sat down, you can begin. Um, so I would recommend that if you need to, like I think it was Gary Ravel that said at the beginning, as like getting them in the room and sending them back out. Sometimes you have to do things over and over again until the students get the message that these are your expectations. So if you have used this game before or this stand up game, you can type in the chat. As I always say, I don't want to be stood here being ignored. You can stand up as well. Um, so that's the reason. And so top tip seven is eyes on the clock. So I have used this quite regularly as it goes with the looking bored strategy I mentioned earlier. So if you do wear a watch and maybe watches have faded out over time now because of digital, if you do have a watch still or a clock in your classroom, um, sometimes I used to look at my watch and even tap it as an indication of that you're wasting my time. Um, obviously you could add minutes to the lesson and write down the names of the pupils on a piece of paper who are, who are still not complying or wasting the time and then follow through privately at the end with those students and obviously then using your reinforcement techniques to praise the ones that are. So that would be my seventh tip. So if you've tried all of those things and you've got the majority of the pupils being quiet, as I've all said, you're always going to have one or two pupils in every school that maybe are trickier individuals. So identify the students who are driving the disturbance and tactically position yourself near to them. So I've all said this earlier, so you could tap them on the shoulder or quietly address them. 
um, to remind them of their expectations. So, for example, Billy, you know, talking when I'm teaching, thank you. So it's really important that you enforce your classroom rules and expectations and you should always say thank you rather than please because if you say please then they've got an option not to do it. You could also write them a little note on a post-it note just to say you know can you be quiet. Obviously if they don't amend their behaviour you need to follow through the sanctions um, that your school has if you've tried all of these things. So if you have got some top positive reinforcement phrases um, that you use for tricky individuals, you can share them in the chat at the, with the other people in the meeting. And the final one that you could try, which I haven't used any of these, but I have seen other colleagues have them, is you could try a noise monitor. Um, so some people can make them themselves. So the one that um, I've seen in people's classrooms, they've made themselves, has just got a little dial that they can turn. So if it's part of a talk or it's whispers or it's group discussion, you can obviously go onto Amazon and you can buy a traffic light like the one there, or you can get some apps on your phone. But I did find um, two that were free for you to use in the classroom. So one's called Bouncy Balls. And um, so if you click on that link, you can put that on your screen as you teach them. And the other one was a class craft free classroom noise monitor, um, which was quite a funky one. So there's two there that you can have a go. So if you do use a noise monitor and you've got a good app that other people could uh, try out, put your recommendations in the chat. OK, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, so one of the recommendations, one of the, the feedback we got from the, the last webinar we did, that people would like reading lists. Um, so these are some of the books um, that I would recommend. I, I've read personally, and Avril has, has read, and, and Tanya. Um, so Rob Plevin, he, he has loads and loads of techniques. If you sign up to his email uh, thing, he sends out um, quite a lot of different emails with techniques on them. I think most of us as, as, you know, as NQTs or trainees probably read the Getting the Buggers to Behave book which is a really good one by Sue Cowley. And um, one which is quite recent is When the Adults Change, Everything Changes by Paul Bix. Um, it's a really good read. You can get it on um, audio as well if you have Audible. Um, so check that one out. That's a really interesting one. And one which you might have not heard of um, is a Kagan one called Win-Win Discipline. Um, the, the only disadvantage of this one is it's very expensive. So I think it's about 40 or 50 pounds or something like that. It's really expensive, but it's it's you know one of the best behaviour books I've ever written because it's so in depth and goes into lots and lots of details about why children behave in certain ways. And um, so there's a lot of psychology in there. So I would highly recommend uh, that if you're really really struggling with behaviour, and uh, it's got some tips. Uh, EF, the Ed Education Endowment Foundation, have also um, published um, something which kind of links to whole school behaviour, but the bits on there which you can use yourself. So there's a link on that. And then here's the one which. Um, I think uh, Tanya was talking about the, the Twitter link that you might want to have a look at as well. Uh, other resources, I think might be an Avril uh, that you can have a look at as well um, to help you. Um, th that's, that was it. I think the picture that Avril said on your desk for relationships. So I just want to say a massive thank you coming towards the end now um, to all these people on the, the screen. So Elementary Technology, thank you. They, they allow us to use their webinar software, which is is, you know, it's quite expensive to, to, to do and they give us lots and lots of support in terms of prizes uh, and design our logos and stuff like that. Brilliant. Crown House Publishing, uh, fantastic um, publishing place for books or spe specifically teaching books. I know when you go on Amazon, it's quite difficult to find teaching books. There's no category or whatever for it. If you go on Crown House Publishing, they're just specialising in teaching stuff and you can also have a look at what's coming in the next few months as well, which is quite good. So you can go, oh, that, that book's really good for the future. I'll pre-order it or whatever. Um, this, this time, the Positive Teacher Company, I've not heard of these until um, I'd seen a lot of people on Facebook groups. They do some really, really good uh, planners, um, assessment marking folders, but they also do like positive postcards home, uh, little positive um, sticker things as well. So check out that they're, they're, they're really good. Uh, and obviously class charts as well. Um, I've used class charts for many years. And it's just an amazing uh, behavior tool, um, seating plan. It's got all sorts of different things that you can do on it, homework, etc. And um, so if you're interested in that, um, Mally Wilson is, is one of the, the top sales guys there. And he's absolutely amazing. Um, his email's on there if you want to just get in touch and find out more about it or visit the website. And then thank you, Tanya, um, for, for helping us out. She volunteered to do it, which was amazing. 
and she's got her own YouTube channel and Facebook page and Twitter. So if you're interested in history stuff, then get on there. There's loads and loads of useful stuff for history teachers. And moving on, um, we always do competitions in our webinars. And the last um, webinar, we had three competitions, one from Elementary Technology, where we had really lovely of them, gave us two prizes of 25 Amazon vouchers and randomly drawn were, were Josephine Menza and Rachel Calvert. And they, there's some pictures of the prizes they chose with those £25 Amazon vouchers. Credits Publishing gave us £50 worth of credit to spend on their website. And uh, Sandra Sharif um, was lucky enough to win that and bought loads of books with it. And then the Sticker Factory as well. And uh, thank you to them. They gave us some A4 stickers. And there were three people that sort of chose their own. These are from, from um, um, Joanne Brodie's, what she chose and got, got delivered to her um, very quickly. So one of my favourite parts of the webinar is the feedback for the, for the competition for, for this webinar. So we've got four prizes all together uh, in this one. I think 11 all together. Um, this is from two companies. And then I'm going to give, tell you about how you can win from another two companies in a second. So again, Elementary Technology have kindly donated us two prizes of £25 Amazon vouchers. And Credit Publishing have also uh, given us three copies uh, worth £16.99 of Paul Dixie's book, which is a really, really good read. Now, if you already have a copy of that book and you win, then they've said you can choose another book uh, from the website as well for a similar, you know, a similar cost. And the only thing which they would like you to do is to consent to being signed up to the uh, mailing list. And you can unsubscribe, unsubscribe from that at any time you want, uh, but they do send offers and stuff like 30%, I think is an offer that they have at the moment from the website. So all you need to do to enter those competitions um, when we close this webinar, it should give you a link or it should open up the feedback form. If not, um, when we send this out via email tomorrow, it will have the PowerPoint and everything with it. So you can just click on the link. Um, but I will put it in the chat at the end as well. So just go on there, fill in the feedback and you'll be automatically entered into those competitions. Competition closes next Friday, the 28th at 3.30. And we'll announce the winners on the, the Monday of, of that week. Um, you'll get, we'll get in touch with the email and, and we'll let you know via social media. So three social media things that we'll, we'll let people know who's won. Um, our Facebook group, we've got our brand new Twitter. We've got a few followers on there, so please uh, add us. We want to get more and more followers. And then our YouTube channel, which has got some really good starters and plenary uh, bite-sized videos. All of our webinars that we record go on that YouTube channel. Um, so please, please subscribe to us and obviously get updates on videos that have been released. Um, and if you've got any further questions after the webinar, then please um, email us at uh, tntteachandlearning at gmail.com uh, to ask us further questions. And we'll come back to asking some Q&A in a second. But just before we do that, um, I, talk, I said at the beginning that we wanted to split this into two parts because it was quite big. So our second session, Behaviour Blueprint 2.0, uh, we're going to record it and we're going to upload it to our YouTube channel. So if you want to learn about how to deal with um, behaviour in the moment, so when it's happening in your classroom, how do you deal with it? And then how you follow up with that behaviour, so in terms of after the lesson or speaking to parents, um, we're going to be going through that as a recording. So that should be uh, on our YouTube channel, possibly later tonight, or it will be um, tomorrow or, or Sunday. Uh, but it will definitely be in the next few days we will upload uh, that for you to watch. Now in that we've got another two competitions uh, for you to win and they're a bit more interactive than filling in the feedback and um, so we've got five prizes of five pound gift vouchers to spend at the Positive Teacher Company so like I so say you can buy really cool stickers, really cool little um, postcards to send home and then we've also got from Class Charts um, who also uh, very generously donated uh, 50 pounds worth of a meal voucher uh, at any restaurant in your choice. Now, obviously, if you're from a, another country, then it's the equivalent of 50 pounds in uh, English money. And um, so I know in some countries uh, that could be quite a, worth a, quite a lot of money. So you could have a, your whole family going out for, for a meal, which would be nice. Um, and, and all you would do with that is we draw it, draw it the winner uh, from our competition. Uh, and, you know, you, you pay for it and then we would then just give you the money back via bank account or check or whatever way you wanted that money to, to do it. So please watch our video if you want to be entered into those competitions and there'll be more details on how you can do that. So we'll just uh, finally finish off with a bit of Q&A. So I think there's been quite a few questions. So Avril and Tanya, if you want to jump in on these as well. Um, yeah. 
So we've got, first of all, how many icebreaker activities do you recommend? Would you say that it should be in the first lesson, um, 50 minutes or less? How many would you say, Avril, in your first lesson? I think it would depend on, on the class. Um, I think the primary school teacher, she did it over a period of lessons where they interviewed each other so they could all get to know each other in the class. But in a secondary school, I don't think that's as necessary. So I would maybe just in a secondary school environment, I'd just do one icebreaker and use that opportunity to filter around the classroom and get to the, know the students. Okay, thank you. So next one is, would you introduce yourself like 10 facts about me or two truths and a lie? Could you do that as a teacher yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a good strategy as well. Obviously, sharing your, your personal information, you have to be careful with how much you do. But I think it allows the students to realise that you, you I call it like a real person and you're not just a teacher. So sharing if you've got children or some of your own personal interests, that it can just help build those relationships and the see that you've got an, a life outside of the classroom. Because I've been in teaching for quite a long time and they'd be like, oh, what, you, you play netball? It's not like, yeah. <laughs> why do I not look like that and um, so it's good to, to share stuff with the students it, it does help positive relationships get established and uh, next one is um, have you any advice I think you answered a little bit on this as well Tanya have you any advice on a system to remember names well it, it comes with practice really and time and um, I have like a file of facts in my brain of last names and I generally just associate people with their last names and then work through who's got the same last name but I'm probably just a bit of an oddball on that one I think you just need to use your seat in plans and then if you put them in alphabetical order and you're doing the register it should be quite simple and if like Avril said I always like to have my books on the desk before they come in so I know where they, they're sat but if you're doing your register when you do your register and you just if you haven't put them in alphabetical order if you just say can you give me a wave then you can kind of mentally visualize where they are in the room and if you're doing q a and you don't know who they are you just need to say can you remind me what's your name or i mean my one is how do you pronounce certain names so sometimes i'll need to write it down phonetically so it's all just it's all just practice really i uh, think just adding to that when i get a new class I, I like to learn all the names. Um, so when I'm doing the register, like Tanya says, I, I'll say, right, I'm going to try and learn your, your names over this next week or two. And I'll dwindle it down to five, six. And there's always some that I just can't get. So it just becomes a joke. If they know it's not personal, it's like, oh, I can never remember you. But I just set myself that challenge of trying to be able to point to everybody and, and, and say their names. So if they're doing a, a task independently, I might go around the classroom and go, right, I'm going to see if I can name everybody's names. And they quite like that. Um, but I find it important to, to get to learn the names really quickly as you can. I think yeah. one, uh, one of the things I think is not to be embarrassed. You know, I sometimes hold my seating plan up to be, you know, and say, right, you know, J Jessica, answer me the question. Or, um, you know, don't feel embarrassed to ask them the name. Can you just remind me of your name again? Because sometimes you feel awful that you don't know the name. But, you know, you've got, if you're a secondary teacher, you've got hundreds of students. One thing I do as well is in terms of praise is I put positive names on the board. So when someone's sitting quietly, I'll say, thank you for sitting quietly, Jessica, and I'll put the name on the board. So by doing that process, it's constantly reminding me what the name is. Or I'll ask them, what's your name again? I'll just put you on the board for being positive. Next one, um, will the slides be recorded and available for later reference? Yes, um, you'll get an email if you signed up, which most, all of you did. Um, tomorrow with the link to the video but it's also on our YouTube channel so if you just type in TNT Teach and Learning on YouTube you'll be able to find our channel and we'll upload those in the next day or so and um, we'll also put send out a link with the email to all the resources and stuff like that that you can get um, yeah can you show the video links on the chat please yep yeah, like I say we'll send this out so you can just use the PowerPoint and click through whatever you want um, would you do call and respond to key stage four? Well, I haven't used call and respond personally. Um, so I don't know whether you could do. I think it depends on the class. If you've got a good relationship with your class and, you know, you're one of those all signal, you know, you could be a very, it depends on your personality. If you've got the personality to pull off a call and respond with a key stage four class, it, I would give it a go, but to me, I think it's probably lower down the school in primary. Uh, Gary, what year did you use it? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I've seen videos in Power Teaching, you know, being used with university students, you know. So again, I think it's about your personality. Just 
having that confidence, you know, to yeah. make, you know, feel a bit silly sometimes. Because sometimes you think, I'm not going to do it because they're all just going to laugh at me. But actually, you'd be surprised that when you do try it with all the kids, you probably like it just as much as, as the younger yeah. ones. Yeah, I think it just depends if, you know, how well you know the class and the personality of the class. If they're all very serious, then they might not they might not want to do it. If they're into music, you know, like some classes like music being played in the background, I think you need to gauge the personality of the class if they're going to go along with it, perhaps, for that one. It's worth giving it a try, isn't it? It's yeah. One of those, take a risk if you, if you want to give it a go. It yeah. Might pay off. It might not. Just, just give it a try. And the next one, do you have any advice on supply teachers who don't know the class? Um, I personally say, if you've got a seating plan thing like class charts in your school, um, or you know, if if you, you know, regularly do a class that you do supply, then it's always good to get the seating plan so you know where they're sat. Um, I know I've done supply stuff in the past, and you know, it is difficult. I think learning names or knowing where the kids sit. Um, but I think as well, you know, if, if you're going into a class and you need to establish those, practice those rules, you know, don't be afraid to do it as a supply teacher. You know, you're going in, spending five, ten minutes, right, you know, this is not over here, go back outside, line up again, mm -hmm. you know, and put that in and, you know, and that'll help you to reinforce those routines. I'd just add to that, just if you would not provided with the, from the school with a seating plan, maybe ask ask for the seating plan if you want to you know carry on with where they normally sit with the regular teacher but if it's a long-term supply then definitely start off where you mean to go on and set them in your own seating plan um, is the track and trace feature free on class charts yes i think it is i spoke to uh, malcolm yesterday Mally yesterday and i think it's it's part of the standard package of class charts so i think they are bringing it out i don't know whether it's already on there or in you know the next couple of weeks and um, so it, it is on there can I arrange seating plans in alphabetical order as I don't know them yet? I think you said that, Tanya, didn't you? That's, you can do that. Yeah, well. I mean, I've done not seating plans many a time and um, sometimes I do it alphabetically, but if that class, for example, has um, is in the same class like drop of a history RE and they're going around in the same order, sometimes it's a good idea to mix them up. So this year I did it inverted, where I started off with the first side of the alphabet and then sat with next to the last person in the alphabet and then it worked its way in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I kind of mixed it up because I, I kind of have the feeling sometimes they go around and they're sat next to the same people in every class. So you can, you, I mean, you can use Kagan as well for the seating plans where you put like a weak person next to a middle person or a top person next to a middle person. You can do your seating plans in lots of different ways. I mean, alphabetical boy, girl is easiest, but you don't know until you do it whether there's going to be any issues with the people that are next to. I think if you have uh, class charts and specifically it has a feature that it learns when you give achievement points or negative points to pupils throughout the school, and what it can it does, if you press a button, it actually seats them uh, according to, you know, how many, if they sat with a per, certain pupil, it knows not to put them together because when they are sat together in other lessons, they get negative points together. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like a, 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 you know, an artificial intelligence sort of thing. And it, sometimes it can do it for you. Just click a button and it rearranges it based on that sort of formula algorithm. And then last two ones, any advice about double lessons? how to give time to students between the two lessons, but not lose them on the behaviour side. I've taught lots of double lessons um, for GCSE, but it was generally over lunch, but sometimes it was lesson one and two. Um, I think you maybe give them a five minute break in the middle, but it could be to watch a clip or play a game. Um, so something that they're not writing, but um, I wouldn't say you can have five minutes to chat. It would just be, like put down your pen and we'll do like a brain gym or something like that and um, so that would be my advice i think i think when when you're planning for double lessons try and plan short if you know if it's a two-hour lesson break it up into 10 15 minute variety of activities so that they don't get bored over that two hour period so trying to plan your lessons differently so that you've got lots of different activities in that block and then you know, hopefully time will fly, they won't even realise that, that they've been in there at that long. I think if we can get that right, then they, they'll not want to get off task with the Yeah. Day. Okay, and then the last one, any advice and tips for PGCE students starting in September? 
That's quite well, a lot, isn't it? I mean, is, is that if it's relating to behaviour, I think you just need to observe the teachers and listen to university lecturers. So when you go into schools, just observe and then just write down everything you see that they're doing behaviour wise. Um, so I wouldn't really worry about putting any of it into action until you have observed a, a host of different staff and seen what they do in lots of subjects and I would just make notes. So my advice would be to pr practice projecting your voice in the first place, practice the counting down um, and then just observe the techniques of the staff use. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much. I know we've overran on slightly a little bit, but thank you very much everyone for joining us. Um, and hopefully, um, don't forget, uh, fill in the feedback form. I'll copy and paste it uh, while I'm speaking now into the um, chat. And then we've got, uh, you can do the feedback now to enter the competitions. And then in the next day or so, we're also going to upload the second part of this webinar. Again, all free, be on our YouTube channel. Um, so please um, get on that and try and win yourself some prizes and also learn some, some new stuff about behaviour. So there's the link to the feedback form. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And then um, we are, we're going to have a, a really good, another special guest in our September uh, webinar. We'll release some details. Quite a famous teacher who's written a couple of books. Um, so we've got a really good uh, special guest coming up in September as well. So please get on the social media so you can uh, find out who that is going to be. So thank you very much, Avril. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you everyone much for joining. And, um, you know, if you need us, we're, we're, we're there just get in contact with us and we're happy to help you. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.